Insurance fraud has hit epidemic levels in the UK. It costs more than £1.3 billion a year. That's nearly £3.6 million a day. Deliberate crashes, bogus personal injuries, even phantom pets. The fraudsters are risking more and more to make a quick killing. And every year, it's adding more than £50 to your insurance bill. But insurers are fighting back, exposing just under 15 fake claims every hour. Armed with covert surveillance systems. That's the subject out the vehicle. Sophisticated data analysis techniques. <laughs> and a number of highly skilled police units. <laughs> they're catching the criminals red-handed. Just don't lie to us. Instead of getting away with it, more and more of these fraudsters are being claimed and shamed. Today, undercover filming exposes one man's attempt to cheat his way to a £1 million payout. We were quite surprised by um, what we saw because what we'd been told uh, by him and his medical experts seemed like he was quite severely disabled. An absent-minded opportunist is in need of a second opinion. If this was a genuine claim, you wouldn't expect the customer to have to go and ask his wife to confirm certain version of events. You don't mind if I double check the one by Mrs. Please? Oh, sure, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just one second. And a would-be fraudster attempts to extend her home insurance claim. I think the policyholder saw us handing the file over as an opportunity, so we suddenly found that there was additional damage alleged to the landing and to the dining room area, none of which had been mentioned previously. A whopping 70,000 injuries were reported by employers between 2016 and 2017. Given we spend so much time at work, perhaps that's not so surprising. Now, whilst it's distressing for those who make genuine claims, there are some people who use potential hazards encountered in their occupation as an excuse to make money fraudulently. Employers have a duty of care to their workforce and there are measures in place to protect them. But this doesn't stop unscrupulous chances from trying to claim a fast buck where they see an opportunity. But as a case that insurers QBE recently completed illustrates, that can be a very dangerous game indeed. We first received a claim from this claimant in May 2013. The claimant was alleging that his work was restricted because he was suffering with asthma uh, as a result of exposure to paint fumes. He'd been working for our insured for around 25 years and during that period had been in close proximity to paint fumes which contained isocyanides. The, the side effects of exposure to the isocyanides can be uh, asthma and it's a, it's a well-known cause of asthma. The employee was suggesting he was having serious health issues that were specifically linked to his job. The claimant said that he'd actually started to develop symptoms in March 2012 and as a result of his complaint, his employer, our insured, referred him to see a medical expert to see if the asthma could be work-related. The medical expert was satisfied that he had developed asthma as a result of exposure to the isocyanides. He was then sent to another expert in London who also confirmed that they believed he had um, developed asthma. The standard practice in such cases where the asthma has been linked to the workplace is that he should be removed from that uh, occupation, which is what happened. So, as a result of his job, the claimant had developed asthma and, according to him, it was having a huge impact on his life. The claimant alleged that the condition was actually preventing him from doing his daily chores, such as shopping, DIY, um, he couldn't go to the gym, he couldn't take his dog for a walk, he needed the use of a stick. He was unable to walk more than 10 steps before he would have to stop for a break and would be breathless and coughing and wheezing. He was using multiple inhalers and was undergoing steroid therapy. Because of his condition, the claimant's life had been turned upside down and although money wouldn't be able to put it right, the amount of compensation wasn't a figure to be sniffed at. The claimant was looking to recuperate costs for past losses um, of earnings, care, future losses, but also uh, adaptations to his home and other miscellaneous expenses. 
Essentially, the claimant was looking for around one and a half million pounds. As with any other claim, QBE had to be certain it was genuine before it could be settled. And there were a number of questions that needed answering. We'd had some concerns about the causative nature of the injury. There were no particular dangers that were identified in the claimant's field of work. His complaint was to do with paint fumes from a neighbouring operation. As he wasn't working closely enough to the paint fumes to be so badly affected, QBE suspected the claimant was exaggerating his symptoms. In addition, although the medical experts said the asthma was possible, they also said it was extremely rare. These two factors combined prompted action insurers don't take lightly. We decided to take some surveillance to see if he actually was genuine. Surveillance is just that, a chance to observe the claimant going about their everyday business without them knowing they're being watched. In this case, it was very enlightening. We are expecting to see somebody that was quite uh, severely debilitated uh, from his asthma and really struggling to, to get around. But what in fact we did see was somebody who seemed to be going about his normal activities without any problems whatsoever. He's taken his dog for a walk, um, he's got no difficulties doing so. That is something he, he seemed to do on a regular basis. He can be seen uh, attending the gym, which he walked to uh, every time, and he, he didn't stop once to take a breath. Now, what was it we heard earlier? That the claimant was unable to do his daily chores? He said he couldn't do DIY, but look, he's getting a real shine on those windows. That looks like a heavy item. He's got a friend roped in for that one. There's no sign of him having to use a walking stick either. Here, he's walking and talking and doesn't appear remotely breathless. He walks um, across all terrains, uh, up and down hills, without any apparent uh, disability. And at no point does he stop to take a breath from an inhaler or, or, or sit down. We were quite surprised by um, what we saw because what we'd been told uh, by him and his medical experts seemed like he was quite severely disabled. The, the only conclusion we could bring was that he'd actually tried to deceive us and that he didn't actually have occupational asthma in the first place. He might have pulled the wool over the medical experts' eyes when he'd been examined, but QBE was determined to pursue this case right to the end. Having seen the surveillance footage, we made the decision to contest the claim in full and to trial. At the trial, the judge found that the claimant had actually lied to him, but he did think that there was a degree of injury, so he awarded him roughly 10% of what his entire claim was, which was £157,000. More than £150,000 is still a vast sum of money, but any hopes the claimant had of keeping it were about to be dashed. We were frustrated by the judgment because we didn't feel he'd sustained any injury at all. So as a result, we lodged an appeal. This time, justice was on QBE's side. The judge found that he shouldn't have received any damages at all, so the entirety of his claim was struck out. We were awarded our costs against the claimant. He was also told that he should not have claimed his pension that he did and all the benefits that he received. In addition to that, we also were successful in our tort of deceit claim against him. So in addition to massive financial penalties, the tort claim could also hit the claimant hard. This is a legal term where a wrong caused by one party, in this case the claimant, results in the loss or harm to another. Here, it was QBE and it wasn't going to let this matter drop. The consequences for the claimant have been quite uh, significant because uh, he lost a job that was relatively well paid, I believe. Um, he's going to struggle to get another job and he owes us hundreds of thousands of pounds. He's also got the Department of Work and Pensions investigating him. Uh, potentially, he could lose his house. The temptation of a life-changing amount of money he wasn't entitled to has certainly altered this claimant's life, but not in the way he was hoping. We were extremely pleased with the findings from the court case because it vindicated our thoughts on the case and also it was a significant sum of money that he was trying to defraud us of, which essentially we stopped.
Later, a claimant's photography skills come under scrutiny as she attempts to claim for some lost jewellery. It's always quite suspicious to us when somebody initially says they don't have a photograph and then you receive one that's particularly good. And a prisoner earns himself additional time behind bars when he slips up. He was initially cooperative with treatment that he received and that's when he was overheard shouting to his peers on the, the wings where there's blame, there's a claim. Many of us have a favourite item of jewellery. It could be a gift from a loved one or a family heirloom, meaning it could have great sentimental value. So if it's lost or stolen, this can be extremely distressing. Those who are less than honest can take advantage of an emotional attachment to a trinket to help further a fraudulent claim. LMG, which manages insurance claims for jewellery, has witnessed this in the past. It's possible that some unscrupulous customers slip through the net. The claim was for a bracelet and a number of charms that had been lost on a train, which was potentially in the region of about £2,500. Just a couple of things we need to just clarify, um, and then we should be able to get working on the value. So when did you first have the bracelet? Um, I was given the bracelet, oh gosh, quite a few years ago now, over five years ago, just the bracelet, and then of course as time went on, I, you know, got, you know, the charm. Yeah. Came loaded. I can't remember the exact date. Yeah, that's fine. And with the bracelet, though, are you saying that was gold or so? Did it just have gold on it, or was it the gold? It had, it was, the bracelet was gold, and also the charms were gold. A couple of them had um, diamonds, yeah, and some had other stones. And then I had two other um, charms, which were a different brand, which were silver and gold. Yeah, fine. She told us that her husband had bought her the bracelet, and then family members had over time purchased charms for her. We always ask for any proof of ownership at the start of a claim. That can come in a variety of forms, some photographs, some receipts, some valuations if they've got them. What was sent in this case was a little unorthodox and rather surprising given the value of the bracelet. The customer provided some form of substantiation at the start, which was an A4 printout of basically an arm with a bracelet on, but it was very blurred. It wasn't particularly useful because although it showed jewellery, you couldn't actually identify what the item was. As evidence goes, it wasn't exactly helpful. We did ask whether they could get further pictures and the policy holder told us that they might be able to get details off an old phone from the husband, but that would take a bit of time. Due to our concerns, we issued a report back to the insurance company which detailed a substantiation photograph that we'd received. The insurers came back to us and said that they wouldn't pay out on the claim until the policy order gave us further substantiation that was of a better quality. We contacted the insured again to then try and obtain further information and say, basically say to them, until we've got this information or better quality information, then your insurance company would not pay out on the claim. Given a bit of an incentive, the claimant came up trumps. We did then receive a new photograph, which was a much better photograph of the item in question, which has come from an unlocked and repaired phone, um, which apparently they said they were very difficult to get. It's always quite suspicious to us when somebody initially says they don't have a photograph or it's very difficult for them to get a photograph and then you receive one that's particularly good and shows the whole item. The picture threw a further clangour in the works and cast serious doubt about her case and credibility. The new photograph she'd provided then did not match the description that the policy holder had given us originally. We managed to obtain that it had been downloaded from the internet, despite the fact that we asked her specifically whether the item in the photograph was her item, which she confirmed and said yes, it was. Using reverse image technology, LMG established this had come from a social media website and so clearly wasn't the claimant's bracelet. Things weren't looking good for the policyholder. One photo was too blurred to be able to see anything and another was blatantly taken from the web. During our further questioning of the policyholder after we then had the photograph, 
she changed her story about the purchase details and who had bought the charms. Right, so you've received the photographs that you kindly yeah, you've sent, sent in. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, had yeah they've, they've arrived. Yeah. So, uh, is, is that the bracelet that was gifted to you at the beginning? Yeah, um, yeah, from my husband, yeah. Uh, so he bought you, like, a, an yeah, almost complete bracelet? Yeah, he did, yeah. Okay. And then the other charms were, were yeah, off. I did, yeah. And I miss it terribly. Yeah. Okay. even talking about it. We asked specifically whether it had been bought with a number of the charms on. She said yes, which was then different to what she told us originally, where she said that family members had purchased them for her over a period of time. The outcome of this claim wasn't surprising. So the result in the end was that we had too many inconsistencies in the information provided, so the claim was declined by the insurance company. This case serves as a stark reminder that insurers and claims validation companies like LMG are constantly on the lookout for dubious and dishonest claims. It's important that these claims don't get paid out, really, because they cost the insurance company an awful lot of money, which then subsequently pushes premiums up for everybody else. Some people just don't know when to stop. Opportunists who've made legitimate, successful claims in the past may chance their arm again without having a valid case. But those people who do try it on run the risk of getting caught, and that can result in being blacklisted and difficulties getting insurance in the future. Insurance companies share information, and one of the advantages is that it means serial fraudsters can be identified more easily. RSA dealt with one case that shows how vital it is to record evidence and keep it. John Beadle remembers it well. This was a claim for water damage caused by a burst pipe. It had apparently damaged two bathrooms, a bedroom, a dining area, and the kitchen spread over three floors of the premises. We reserved this claim at about £24,000. As we would in normal circumstances, uh, given a claim of this nature, we appointed a loss adjuster to attend the premises and to work with the policy holder to try and uh, get the claim rectified uh, as soon as possible. But alarm bells went off when the company paid the claimant a visit. When the loss adjuster um, attended the premises, he was slightly concerned with the insured's behaviour. She was evasive. Uh, and she couldn't seem to answer even the simplest of questions, uh, so questions around any previous claims or other questions simply demanding a, a, a yes or no answer seemed to go un unanswered. It transpired that there was a reason for the evasive response, and RSA soon discovered that suspicions about this case were justified. We did establish that there had been uh, a previous um, escape of water claim at the premises with another insurer some five years previous. Pretty similar to the claim that we were now facing, and this claim was settled for some £20,000. As there was more than a whiff of déjà vu, RSA decided to take action. Now, fraud investigator, he did in he attend the premises and found that there was water damage consistent with an escape in a bathroom, but he couldn't find any evidence in the other rooms as claimed. He couldn't find the source of the leak. The claimant explained that her husband had repaired the leak, which would explain why we couldn't find the source of it. She also explained that a mattress was damaged, uh, but rather strangely, this mattress had already been disposed of and replaced by a brand new mattress, which our policyholder bought from a man who happened to knock on her door. I've never seen somebody selling mattresses door to door, but you never know. As far as RSA was concerned, it was all a bit too convenient. All of the evidence that it needed to validate the claim had simply disappeared. There was no sign of a recent leak, and miraculously, a mattress salesman had turned up on her doorstep and the list of things she was claiming for kept on growing. 
Well, I think the policyholder saw us handing the file over as an opportunity to actually add some more damage into the claim. So we suddenly found that there was additional damage alleged to the landing and to the dining room area, none of which had been mentioned previously. Intriguing. But there was no hard evidence for the level of damage being suggested. Our, our investigation uh, concluded that we thought a lot of this damage wasn't related to the recent claim, but indeed to the original claim some five years previous. Unfortunately, the insurer on that occasion had destroyed all their paperwork um, and the photographs, so we were unable to use those as evidence. Things were looking promising for the claimant. We were preparing to settle the claim for the damage to the bathroom, um, which we um, thought did happen in the recent uh, escape of water. And we were doing this on the basis that we had no evidence um, from the previous claim. Despite reservations, there was nothing else RSA could do at this point, but some useful information emerged at just the right time. Very fortunately, one of the suppliers um, had worked on the previous claim five years ago, and they were able to produce documentation and, more importantly, photographs of the previous damage. The photographs were extremely revealing because they showed exactly the same decoration and damage as was evident on this occasion. So it became apparent to us that the policyholder had received the £20,000 from their previous insurers, but had not, in fact, repaired the damage and left it as it was, and are now seeking to make a further claim for the same property that was damaged. RSA now had the ammunition needed. We immediately challenged our insured, but as she had done throughout, she maintained her stance uh, and continued to insist that all of the damage was from the recent escape of water. We, by this time, were convinced it was fraudulent and we were determined not to pay the claim, so we voided the policy under the fraud condition. You'd think, when presented with hard evidence, the claimant would admit defeat, but she persisted. She was not pleased with this course of action and took us to the Financial Ombudsman Service. The Financial Ombudsman Service is an independent adjudicator in cases where uh, insurers and customers uh, are in dispute. Having investigated um, the circumstances, the adjudicator found in our favour, but our policyholder was not satisfied with this and appealed that decision, and a second adjudicator reviewed the case uh, and then also concluded that our uh, actions were correct in voiding the policy for fraud. This woman went to a lot of effort to make an exaggerated claim. By evading questions, she only raised more, and despite requesting two appeals, she gained nothing. This is a, a classic case of there being a genuine loss, but then this has been grossly exaggerated to include the previous damage and has ended up in the claimant getting nothing. Her policy being voided, which she'll now have to declare, and she will also be on the insurance fraud register, which will cause her great difficulty in getting insurance cover in the future. Still to come, CCTV proves to be the ultimate eyewitness. Looking at the CCTV footage, you can clearly see that the third-party allegations are a complete fabrication. Have you ever had that sinking feeling when you reach for your bag and find out it's not where you left it? Even worse, it contained valuables and there's absolutely no sign of it. As frustrating as that is, an insurance policy can enable us to replace our possessions. But for some opportunists, the temptation of exaggerating what's been lost can be too great to resist. Insurers have to check claims are valid and they have some clever kit to help, but this doesn't stop the more persistent chances. This is something Simon Powell from TCS Claims comes across more often than you might think. 
The claim that was submitted was from a customer that had lost their iPad and it was at a bus stop on the 8th of January. Give me a brief run through about what's actually happened, if that's right, just so I'm up to date. Yeah, actually, you know, I went to the bus stop and I have my bag with me. I just put it in beside me. Over five minutes, I was waiting there. Okay, yeah. Till the bus came and I went over to pick up my bag and my bag was not in there. Not only was the iPad stolen, but there was also an iPhone and other contents as well. I had my sport clothes, my trainer, other things in my bag, and my iPad and my phone. Uh, I just couldn't believe that what happened. The customer submitted a claim for £340. On the face of it, there was nothing untoward with this, so we proceeded to the next stage, which was to ask the customer to supply documentary evidence to support their claim. The customer sent in documentary evidence, and that was a photograph of the back of the iPad, which had the serial number on it. Usually, receipts are sent in as evidence, but the picture from the claimant was quite unusual. To have actually taken a specific photograph of the back of the iPad with the serial number in it just appeared a little strange, and we wanted to investigate that further. When a digital photo is taken, it isn't just the image that is captured. A whole host of details are embedded in the file including when and where the picture was taken. And this information can be crucial for insurers. The information we obtained off this particular photograph was very worrying. It appeared that the photograph had been taken after the claim had been submitted. This caused immediate warning signs. Questions had to be asked. The last thing we've got in is the reason I'm giving you a call today. So I've just had a yeah. quick look through it. That's definitely a picture of the back of the iPad that was stolen, was it? Hundred percent, hundred percent. And it was left in my missus phone. That's why, you know, I had this picture. Okay. Yeah. So that photo you sent us, that's taken on your missus phone, and that's a picture uh, of the back of your iPad that was stolen. Exactly. So when yeah. was that photo taken, do you remember? I can't, I can't remember. I don't know. The customer explained that the photograph had been taken for warranty purposes and it had been taken on his wife's iPhone and it was at this stage that we confronted him with the evidence that we'd gained. So we've got that photograph you sent us and we've run it through a bit of software we have here and it, from this photograph I can confirm it was taken on January the 12th. No, so I, January 12th last year. Of this year, January 12th. This was taken yeah. after you had it stolen. You don't mind if I double check the one by Mrs. Please? Of course, go first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Just one second. If this was a genuine claim, you wouldn't expect the customer to have to go and ask his wife to confirm certain version of events, and this certainly didn't add up. Interestingly, after chatting to his wife, guess what? There's an explanation. Hello. Hey, yeah. Hello, yeah. My missus just reminded me something, yeah. Actually, uh, what happened? The picture is not from that time. Okay. Yeah. The picture was in my Mrs. old phone. I think it was uh, iPhone, iPhone 5. And what we did, we zoomed it on another phone, and we take the picture from my Mrs. phone again from other phone. You know what I mean? So yeah. she's, she's taken a photograph on her iPhone 5. Yeah. And then she's taken a photograph of the iPhone 5 screen. And then that's where you sent the... Oh, yeah, yeah. OK, I mean, that's absolutely fine. That completely explains it, to be honest, OK? So yeah, we're, we're yeah, I am really sorry about all this way. little thing. <laughs> the customer confirmed that this was not an original photograph. He said that this was a photograph of the original, and therefore that's why the dates didn't tie up. This was good news, and if the customer could provide us with the original photograph, we could proceed with the claim. Unfortunately, settling this claim wasn't as simple. I'm going to need to see that picture from the iPhone 5 then, just so I can check that photograph. Yeah, but she doesn't... Yeah. What happened, she sent this old phone as a gift for my nephew. He sent it back to him. Now this phone is not with us. I am really sorry about that. The customer explained to us that the phone had been wiped and it had been sent abroad. It was extremely convenient and clearly didn't give us the evidence that we needed to be able to proceed and settle the claim. We went back to the customer and explained to him that we would be declining the claim. The evidence I've got 
shows the proof that you provided me for your iPad was taken after the incident, which unfortunately is going to result in the claim being declined. But everything I told you 100% is true. That's absolutely fine. I mean, I've just had a quick test. We've, we've yeah. taken some photos of our phones. Yeah. With the photo you sent me, I would yeah. expect to see some sort of light reflection or something like that, and I can't see anything in it. And the fact that you cannot prove your story, I have to go with the evidence I've got. I'll be honest with you. I didn't know you go through all the things. I never lied, not even for iPad. The customer continued to argue that it was a genuine claim, but clearly from the evidence that we had, we were not willing to accept this. And more importantly, that we were voiding the policy from inception. This was the point that the customer really was not happy with. OK, what's going to happen now? Now, unfortunately, we are going to decline the claim. and I'll, I'll get it all closed down for you. In regards to the policy, we are going to put it down as misrepresentation, and the policy will be voided, but I will write everything in a letter and send it to your home address. But which, which claim? Everything? You know, even for my phone as well? The entire claim, everything. That is not right, please, because it is not fair. My phone is gone. Okay, what is wrong with my phone? Because my okay. phone is gone. Maybe you can help me. There's literally no way to help you anymore. I just don't think it is fair. Despite the claim being declined and the customer's policy being cancelled, he still kept trying. We thought it was the last that we would hear from the customer. But it was not. Surprisingly, we then received a home video. The video showed us that the customer had actually found the iPad and it had been found behind a radiator, so it hadn't actually been lost in the first place. To receive a video after we declined the claim was again a really strange thing to do. And based on all the information that we'd obtained, we were satisfied that we'd made the right decision on this claim. So, the iPad hadn't been lost on the bus after all, and this is a scenario Simon sees all too often. Potentially, the bag was lost and it did have items in it, but it certainly didn't have the iPad. We will pay genuine claims, but if you put forward an exaggerated claim, you run the risk of the whole claim being thrown out, and that's clearly what happened on this occasion. There are around 83,000 inmates in the UK's prisons. Whatever offence they've committed, we're safe in the knowledge that they're being punished and hopefully serving time will deter them from returning. Manchester Prison, which dates back to 1868, houses more than 1,000 people. And Rob Young, the governor, is the man in charge of ensuring law and order is maintained. The fraudulent claims in prisons, uh, I mean, we, we, we can't tolerate them because it's an extension of criminality. Irrespective of potential cost to the public purse, it's vitally important that we, uh, we challenge these uh, dishonest, dishonest claims. But even in the secure environment of a prison wing, there's the chance of mishaps and opportunistic claims, including this one. Vicky Caulfield manages all of the litigation claims brought against Manchester Prison. The prisoner was Paul Barnes and he was serving 30 months um, and he'd been in prison at that point uh, for nine days. Mr Barnes's claim was for a head injury and an injury to his wrist after, after slipping in water on the landings on the wings. The injuries were alleged to have been a laceration to the forehead, a sprain injury to the wrist and concussion for two days. This sounds like quite a slip, so investigations began to establish what happened, if indeed it did happen, and if there were any witnesses. All this had to be done with an eye on taxpayers' money. We have to assess cases on a balance of probabilities. Is it in the best interests of the public purse to take a, a claim to trial? We have to balance it on, is our case strong enough to convince a judge that we aren't at fault. In this case, there wasn't that evidence initially. So we made an initial offer of £1,200. Mr Barnes didn't um, accept the, the offer of £1,200. We were never informed as to why he didn't accept that settlement offer. The inquiry uncovered some interesting findings, which raised questions about the truth of Mr Barnes' allegations. We initially became suspicious that the claim might be fraudulent when um, Mr Barnes refused to remove his hand from his head um, when staff went to the cell to inspect his injuries. 
a prisoner not allowing um, prison staff to have an initial look at his injuries um, would raise suspicions. Um, it would make us perhaps think that he had something to hide. From that point, we made further inquiries. It must have been quite tricky to investigate this case if Mr Barnes was unwilling to show the extent of his injury. When a prisoner is injured, the medical staff are called straight away. So they assess um, whether or not it's serious enough to send a prisoner to hospital. And if not, they will do um, treatment on site. The initial assessment from medical staff didn't um, correspond to the injuries that Mr Barnes had alleged to have suffered. Um, medical staff initially recorded it as a minor injury with no substantial lacerations to the forehead. So the medical evidence suggests this wasn't really the knock Mr Barnes was claiming for, and other information came to light. He was initially cooperative with treatment that he received, and that's when he was overheard shouting to his peers on the, the wings where there's blame, there's a claim, um, and he was hit over her by staff as well. It also emerged he'd been very shy about having his injury photographed, which seems a little odd as this was for the solicitors acting on his behalf. When staff attended the wings to speak to Mr Barnes and photograph his injuries, um, he initially asked if he could, he could excuse himself and use the toilet, which he did. Um, the member of staff noted that before he'd left to go to the toilet, there was no marks on his head at all. But when he returned from the toilet, he had a distinctive red mark on his forehead. When asked about it, he said, oh, I've been rubbing it. At that stage, we felt it appropriate to approach the police liaison officer that we have within the prison um, to speak to them about what their, their point of view and whether, whether they thought there was um, any mileage in kind of seeking a, a fraud prosecution. Thankfully, the police liaison officer did take the case to the CPS and the CPS agreed to charge Mr Barnes with fraud by false representation. When it came to his day in court, Mr Barnes was able to throw another curveball. Mr Barnes had initially pled not guilty at the magistrate's court the previous year and because of that, the case had been referred to for trial at the Crown Court. We attended court on the day and Mr Barnes pleaded, changed his plea to guilty um, because of that none, none of our evidence was actually read out at court. None of our witnesses gave, gave their evidence. Perhaps he realised he was pushing his luck and had hoped to get off lightly, but the judge saw through him. At the end of the trial, during the judge's summing up, um, the judge concluded that the reason why Mr Barnes didn't accept the initial offer is because he was greedy and that he wanted more money from the claim. Mr Barnes received a 23-week sentence suspended for two years and 100, hour, 100 hours unpaid work. We were very pleased with the outcome. It meant that we'd saved money from the public purse. This was one case in one prison, but across the UK, this all adds up. Governor Rob Young believes they were right to challenge Mr Barnes. There is a, a misconception that uh, fraudulent claims are, is a victimless crime, both in the community and within prisons. I mean, that's, a, um, that's an incorrect view. The cost to the taxpayer um, is incredible and we reduce that by addressing and investigating and challenging those fraudulent claims. When you get on a bus as a passenger, the last thing on your mind is that your run-of-the-mill journey could be hijacked by fraudsters who are trying to cash in. But as this series highlights, unfortunately, that is a possibility. Buses are targets for opportunistic scammers, and there are people out there who will put the lives of passengers at risk to fake an insurance claim. Bus Operator First Group deals with attempts like this so often that it has a team in place to investigate suspicious cases. We were presented with a claim from a third party that alleged that our bus changed lanes and collided with the near side front of a vehicle. A crash between a 12-ton bus and a car is never going to end up well for the car, and the driver was claiming to be badly affected by the accident, both physically and mentally. As a result of the collision, the third party alleged that she sustained injuries to her neck, to her shoulder, uh, she had a fear of travel, and she couldn't sleep. The claimant also alleged that she couldn't do her shopping, she couldn't do her domestic chores, personal care, uh, they were also restricted, uh, and resulting in her having to have physiotherapy. This all added up to a hefty sum. 
We estimated the cost of the claim to be in the region of £12,000. This would be made up of the claimant's injury, uh, hire charges, the damage to the vehicle and also her legal costs. In serious accidents, costs as high as these aren't uncommon. However, in this case, there was a slight problem that made First Group suspicious. The estimate of £12,000 was quite substantial considering that the damage to the vehicle was no more than minor scraping um, and there was no damage to our bus. And that wasn't the only thing that didn't add up. The driver uh, told us that he was at the traffic lights. Um, as the lights changed, he went to pull off and for some unknown reason, the third party just veered into the side of his bus. With conflicting accounts of what happened, First Group launched an investigation to establish whether the claims for personal injury could be legitimate. We were presented with engineering evidence and this just verified our concerns that the damage was no more than minor scrape into her vehicle. To be absolutely certain, there was one final check to be made, but even this flew in the face of what the claimant would have First Group believe. The next step for us was to download the CCTV footage. We were expecting to see um, the vehicle um, in the right-hand lane pull off from the traffic lights and for our bus to start veering into their lane. But it's not what happened. Looking at the CCTV footage, you can clearly see that the third-party allegations are a complete fabrication. The third party is at the traffic lights with our bus and as they both start to pull off, for no reason, the third party is just steered right into the side of our vehicle. Even though the claimant was clearly at fault for the collision, she then had the nerve to remonstrate with the bus driver, who'd done absolutely nothing wrong. CCTV proved to be an extremely valuable tool in this incident, um, but CCTV is not just used to validate liability, um, it can also be used to spot unusual behaviours of individuals at the scene of the accident. With buses having numerous cameras, both inside and out, the claimant was naive to think she could ever get this claim through. So having reviewed all the evidence, we had no intention of paying out on this claim. Uh, we repudiated the claim in full, and eventually the third party dropped their claim. But if she thought that that would be the end of it, the claimant could be sorely mistaken, because this isn't necessarily going to be the case. First Group have a zero tolerance approach to fraud, it is rather disappointing when someone makes an attempt to defraud our company, and whilst this case might have concluded for the third party for the time being, it hasn't for us. None of us likes paying more than we have to for everyday services, but this is exactly what's happening with insurance fraud. Scammers and con men are swindling their way to payouts that they don't deserve. The knock-on effect is that the extra costs result in ever-increasing premiums, we're getting hit in the pocket, and it's not just organised criminal gangs to blame. Exaggerated claims also take their toll. But instead of getting away with it, more and more of these fraudsters are being claimed and shamed. Yeah.